Well, good morning. We'll go ahead and get started. My name is Kevin Hatton. I'm Chief of Anesthesiology Critical Care here and Associate Professor of Anesthesia and Surgery. Today we're going to talk about, uh, as part of our keyword review, renal dysfunction. <coughs> Presentation goals will be to discuss issues related to renal failure. So, uh, we'll talk about the evaluation and management issues, renal replacement therapies, radiocontrast nephropathy, as well as some pharmacology issues, particularly related to neuromuscular blocking drugs uh, in renal failure. And then we'll briefly describe uh, electrolyte abnormalities. So we'll start with some risk factors for post-operative acute kidney injury, AKI. And to some degree, they're a little bit obvious, right? The first is that patients with pre-existing renal insufficiency or chronic kidney disease have a significantly increased post-operative risk for AKI. Also, patients with pre-existing diabetes, as well as pay, uh, any procedures that you're going to uh, add or uh, use uh, IV contrast. Having all three risk factors increases your total risk of AKI, post-operative AKI, to more than 50%. Uh, anecdotally, it sure seems like 100% of these patients uh, develop acute kidney injury. Um, and to some degree, it may depend largely on what um, scale or what system, classification system, system you use. But they all seem to have significant uh, post-operative renal dysfunction. Admittedly, although it's not in those three uh, well-described features, I find that patients that undergo vascular and cardiac surgery, especially using cardiopulmonary bypass, are at further risk for, for uh, postoperative AKI. So if you do get postoperative acute kidney injury, what, what happens to you? So the major physiologic effects are uremia, acidosis, hyperkalemia, hypermagnesemia, hyperphosphatemia. So your electrolytes all increase, is the good way to think about that. Your electrolytes always increase, always get hypervolemia, and you may have anemia as well. Although anemia is much more rare related to acute kidney injury, this is something that occurs in the chronic setting because of decreased erythropoietin um, production, which typically gives you a, a low reticula, reticulocyte count, but a normal size uh, red blood cell. So it's not like a microcytic anemia, it's sort of a normal cytic anemia. Many patients uh, develop oliguria in acute kidney injury, uh, but, and oliguria is almost always defined as a urine output less than a half cc per kilogram per, per hour. I apologize for the typo there. Remember that not oliguria is bad, and sometimes we, we get so uh, caught up in reflexively oliguria is low or, or, or urine output is low so that we feel like we have to respond in some way, but recognize that Oliguria is a norm, in, in and of itself is a normal response to many physiologic systems. Um, and the three major causes of oliguria are, as we all learned in medical school, pre-renal, intrarenal, and post-renal. Laboratory analysis is something that we do frequently, if you've been in the ICU, and is frequently seen in examinations and frequently asked about on rounds. But the, the sort of the five most commonly used uh, lab analysis is the BUN creatinine ratio, the urine sodium, the urine osmolality, and the so-called FINA, or fractional excretion of sodium, and the FURIA, fractional excretion of urea. Um, the BUN creatinine typically is elevated in patients who are pre-renal. It's typically normal uh, or low, typically around 10 to 15 in folks who have sort of intrinsically renal or ATN or post-renal causes. The urine sodium is typically low in pre-renal and typically high or normal in intrinsically renal and or post-renal, as well as the urine osmolality is typically very high. It's a very concentrated urine in pre-renal and typically low or normal in, in renal and post-renal. Uh, please remember that both hypovolemia, total body fluid uh, deficit, as well as low cardiac output will both cause um, the so-called pre-renal lab value. So it's not always that it's hypovolemia. Low cardiac output states even uh, renal arterial vasoconstriction will look pre-renal. So issues that occur before the blood, before the, uh, the perfusion gets to the kidney itself. So the formulas for fractional excretion of sodium and the fractional excretion of urea there's, for me, no good way to remember this, so it, for me, comes down to just brute force memory. Um, and remember, fractional excretion of urea is used for patients who have recently received loop diuretics. Or flipped around the other way, fractional excretion of sodium 
is not accurate if patients have received loop diuretics in the recent past. Um, it's usually related to the fact that urine sodium is affected by the drugs. Urine uh, creatinine is not usually uh, dramatically affected, so that number doesn't change, but it's the urine sodium that usually changes dramatically from the uh, from loop diuretics. So you have a patient with oliguria that you think is pathophysiologic. What do you do next? The first is rule out uh, a post-renal or an obstructive cause, and these are usually pretty obvious. Uh, have, the, have the nurse, have the tech uh, do a bladder scan and or f try and flush the Foley catheter. If all the urine or all the fluid that they've flushed in comes right back out, then it's likely not a, a, an obstructive cause. Um, remember, in order to get obstructive from uh, obstructive oliguria from kidney stones, it usually has to be bilateral or significantly unilateral or unilateral in a patient with contralateral underlying disease. So if they have an atrophic kidney, then a unilateral stone would actually cause problems. Um, remember to always consider intravascular volume status, and that in and of itself is a, a lecture or two or five or an entire year's worth of lectures. And then consider the renal perfusion state. Is this patient getting good cardiac output? from a, or a good region or renal perfusion, either from a systemic uh, perspective, so low cardiac output syndrome, or do they have some regional cause for pre-renal injury, such as renal artery stenosis? So think about the post-obstructive reasons, evaluate um, uh, renal perfusion, and then ask the question, is there something else that's going on? So what do you, how do you treat oliguria? The use of diuretics to improve renal outcomes is very, is very controversial. Loop diuretics probably don't cause your kidneys to recover, or any diuretics for that matter, probably don't cause your kidneys to recover. There is data that suggests an overall better clinical outcome if a patient continues to make urine versus those patients who do not, but that probably doesn't come down to the effect of the diuretic it probably comes down to the fact that if you're able to make urine still, then you have a less severe injury than if you aren't able to make urine. So the data suggests that non-oliguric kidney injury has a better outcome. But just because you give them diuretics doesn't actually make the renal injury or the patient's outcomes substantially better. And where you're really using diuretics in this setting to prevent the sort of systemic complications of acute kidney injury, such as volume overload and electrolyte abnormalities, particularly hyperkalemia and hypermagnesemia. So what do we do if a patient continues to have significant decompensation or continues to worsen? Well, the answer typically is we go to renal replacement therapy. And the indications for renal replacement therapy can remember by, remembered by the uh, AEIOU rule. So acidosis, electrolyte abnormalities, intoxications, overload, and uremia, A-E-I-O-U, are the indications for renal replacement therapy. And remember, in each of these, it's not just that they have those, it's that they have a systemic complication because of that. So it's not just uremia, the BUN is very high, it's that they're having some complication from that very high BUN, such as pericarditis, altered mental status, coagulopathy. So high lab values in and of themselves are not indications for renal replacement therapy. It's systemic complications of those. There are two major functions of renal replacement therapy. So when, we at, when, when dialysis gets started or CRRT gets started, there's sort of two major things we're looking at. The first is the ability to remove fluid. The second is the ability to remove toxins. And those things can be titrated independently of each other. You can aggressively remove toxins, you can aggressively remove fluid, or you can do a combination of that. Fluid, re fluid removal is commonly known as ultrafiltration. And ultrafiltration can be done in and of itself for patients with uh, um, volume overload states. Most classically, patients with decompensated heart failure whose overall intravascular volume and preload has pushed over the Starling curve you can do just ultrafiltration and slowly pull that fluid off, or actually relatively rapidly pull that fluid off um, over a period of time and improve their cardiac function as well as their pulmonary function. Hemodialysis is a complicated system, but it 
physiologically uses concentration gradients between the patient and the dialysate fluid to pull electrolytes and other small molecules from the blood into the dialysate, which then gets wasted, basically poured down the drain. So if you have someone with a potassium of seven, and you have someone who has a potassium of two, sorry, uh, sorry, you, the patient has a potassium of seven, the dialysate has a potassium of two, as long as there's a concentration gradient from seven to two, you'll continue to remove potassium from the patient. And the higher the, the, the potassium gradient is, the more potassium that will be removed during that time period. So if you have a seven a patient and a zero in the bath, you're going to pull off more potassium than if you were to have seven for the patient and a five in the bath. So the nephrologists can sort of titrate their acute or chronic uh, electrolyte, the patient's electrolytes by titrating how much potassium is in that dialysate. I find that most people that have been on dialysis for a period of time know what potassium bath, so it's called a bath, that they're frequently on. So I usually ask folks in the operating room, how long have you been on, or do you know what, how much potassium is in your bath? And if they do, that tells me that they're A, relatively smart and they've been paying attention to their own care, which probably means a lot of other things, but also that it's been relatively stable. Right? If they can tell you, well, we've been three, well, last week we were on zero and four, the patient's probably non-compliant with their diet, probably going to be non-compliant with a number of other things, but more importantly, their potassium levels have been sort of stable over a period of time. Sometimes patients don't know, and I, they don't know. Also, um, in hemodialysis, typically intermittent hemodialysis, as it's typically done as an outpatient and, and for less acutely ill patients, it's done three to four times a week in relatively short time periods, so two to three, two to three sessions per week. They remember that that's usually relatively poorly tolerated in patients who are critically ill. So if you're hypotensive, low cardiac output state, you're relatively, you're, you're less likely to be able to tolerate that over the long term or even the short term than you are CRT or continuous therapies. CRT is more complicated but the idea is that you, instead of pulling uh, electrolytes and cleaning the blood and pulling volume off for a relatively short time period, you do it continuously. So CRT is used most frequently in patients who are acutely ill, critically ill, who probably won't tolerate from a hemodynamic standpoint the large fluid shifts that occur. So instead of pulling two liters of, or three liters of fluid off in three hours, we may pull a liter, two liters, three liters off over 24 hours. Not only is that less, sort of less fluid per hour, but it also gives your body an opportunity to re-equilibrate from the intravascular space or from the extravascular space to the intravascular space in real time. So you pull off less fluid per hour as well as the physiologic effect of that difference between intravascular and extravascular is sort of repaired sort of more continuously. There are three types of continuous renal replacement therapy that's used. And here at UK, we typically just say, we're going to start CRT, and the nephrologists know which they're using, but it's not necessarily discussed outside of the nephrologists. But CVVH is uh, called hemofiltration. Its major effect is through hemofil or through ultrafiltration. It's able to get a lot of fluid off very rapidly, as well as medium-sized molecules. CVVHD, which is most commonly used here at UK, it's like dialysis, where you use across a concentration gradient but more slowly over a period of time. And then CVVHDF, hemodiafiltration, which is a combination of those features. Um, anytime you have blood moving through plastic, uh, blood wants to coagulate, right? It wants to th uh, create a thrombus. So patients undergoing renal replacement therapy need to have some level of anticoagulation to prevent um, complications. Most commonly, especially in CRT, citrate is added. Remember, citrate is a very strong calcium binder. Um, it's such a strong calcium binder that in patients undergoing CRT, calcium has to frequently be provided back to the patient to prevent hypocalcemia. Um, another thing that can be used is heparin. So if a patient is on systemic heparin, uh, heparinization for whatever reason, 
ECMO, DVTs, PEs, whatever the indication for, or whatever the indication for the heparin, they typically don't need more anticoagulation uh, in addition to that. There's also the ability to provide sort of regionalized anticoagulation so that as the blood comes out of the patient, you can add heparin directly there and then neutralize the heparin at the end by providing protamine. That's very rarely done, but it can be done if the patient has, is having complications of systemic anticoagulation and you want to make sure they don't clot in the CRT machine, but that the patient uh, doesn't want to continue to bleed. Radio contrast nephropathy is likely caused from a combination of direct tubular cell toxicity of the high molecular weight uh, iodinated uh, product, as well as renal medullary ischemia. And uh, renal contrast nephropathy has undergone some debate uh, in recent years about the underlying cause. Most people believe it's probably more likely to be the medullary ischemia now, more than the direct cell toxicity, but to please recognize that there's no good answer to what's the underlying cause. It appears to have a biphasic injury, and so there's sort of biphasic, biphasic hemodynamic changes that occur in the kidney. The first is a transient increase in blood flow, right as you're sort of administering the contrast load, but then very rapidly after that, there's a very prolonged decrease in the overall blood flow. The lab results from, uh, from radio contrast nephropathy look like acute tubular necrosis, which is an intrinsic renal phenomenon. So your B1 creatinine ratio, your furia, your fena, your urine sodium all look like you have intrinsic renal injury in radio contrast nephropathy. The major risk factors, and there's a whole host of them, and, and they look a whole lot like the risk factors for just generalized acute kidney injury. So pre-existing renal disease, diabetes, hypovolemia, congestive heart failure, nephrosis, cirrhosis. If you have to give a large contrast load compared to a small contrast load, and if at the same time you use other nephrotoxic agents such as NSAIDs, ACE inhibitors, other drugs, all of these compound the injury. Probably from a second hit or third hit or however many hit sort of a hypothesis. How do you treat radio contrast nephropathy? sort of a little bit obvious, but number one, if necessary, avoid the contrast or try to use as small volume as possible. There are contrast agents that don't cause the same degree of injury, so non-ionic and low osmolality contrast. They don't provide nearly as good a view as the high osmolality agents, so nephrologists, sorry, radiologists sometimes shy away from them because if you're trying to answer the question, then the worst thing is to get a test that it causes some small amount of injury and then have to repeat it to have a because you didn't answer your question. So uh, there's ongoing debate about what to do and it sort of should probably be patient individualized. Saline, pr saline prehydration therapy is the only thing that's shown to reduce the risk of acute kidney injury. Recognize that the majority of this data is, is in outpatient heart catheterization Probably it's uh, relevant as well in other areas, such as the OR and other procedural areas. Currently, it's the recommendation to use uh, saline prehydration for any patients that get contrast that have risk factors, but the data for, for its use, prehydration in other areas, is not nearly as strong as for heart catheterization. Uh, there are some other th therapies that have been used over the, the sort of the history of the last 10, 15 years, some of them with some data, some of them without data, but the long and short of them is none of these have been shown um, in large randomized studies to be terribly useful. Serum sodium bicarb, um, uh, sort of normal tonic bicarb therapy throughout, has never been, or sorry, was originally shown to be beneficial. Subsequent follow-up studies have shown no, no benefit, and a large meta-analysis shows no benefit. Um, oral or IV mucomist in, in acetylcysteine it has the same sort of data where the first trial showed benefit promising benefit, follow-up studies didn't show the same outcomes, and large meta-analysis basically showed no difference. And then theophylline has been uh, suggested as a possibility, um, although the data on theophylline use is small as well. So we'll sort of turn a little bit and talk a little bit about the pharmacology of, of various drugs, especially as it relates to uh, renal dysfunction. The first we'll talk about is diuretics, because we use diuretics a lot, and diuretics are used frequently in patients with either acute or chronic kidney disease. Um, there's sort of five major uh, classes of diuretics. The first and most commonly used is, are the loop diuretics, which act at the ascending limb, 
uh, of the loop of Henle, and its major uh, mechanism is to inhibit the sodium potassium chloride co-transport. So not only does it cause uh, your, uh, increased free water removal because of the changes in electrolyte composition within the loop of Henle, but it also causes pot uh, potassium loss, calcium loss, and magnesium loss as well. So it causes some electrolyte abnormalities as well. Thiazide diuretics work in the early distal tubule, and they in the thiazide diuretics inhibit a different uh, co-transporter than does the loop diuretics. Potassium sparing diuretics are in the late distal tubule and inhibit sodium and pot uh, reabsorption and potassium secretion. So you're, you keep a higher potassium concentration over the diuretic therapy. Osmotic diuretics are not used very often as a true diuretic. Um, these would be things like mannitol. Uh, they're typically used for other indications, but they can be fantastic diuretics. So if you need fluid off in a relative hurry, uh, you can use mannitol, and it's sure going to make them uh, have a lot of urine output. Osmotic diuretics have sort of three major areas, proximal tubules, the loop of Henle, and the collecting ducts, and they basically inhibit water reabsorption. And then the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors are frequently used, uh, not necessarily as a diuretic, but to uh, uh, treat metabolic alkalosis. Um, they work in the proximal tubules and they inhibit bicarb reabsorption. So the loop diuretics, remember, are furosemide, bumetanide, torsemide, and ethacrinic acid. They result in a significant excretion of urinary water, which just gets the fluid off, potassium, calcium, and magnesium. They can also result in systemic vasodilation, particularly at high doses. So you may get hypotensive from a very large bolus of Lasix. 120, 240, 300 milligrams of Lasix may cause a fairly significant systemic vasodilation. Um, they block the potassium, sodium potassium 2 chloride co-transporters we've already talked about, preventing the reabsorption of electrolytes in water. And remember, their chronic use results in a metabolic alkalosis, and we see this clinically. Their bicarb levels start to rise, and that occurs from a, bi a bicarbonate, bicarb ion reabsorption to maintain urine electrical neutrality. So we talked about thiazide diuretics. Natriuresis is due to blockade of both sodium and chlorine, chloride ion reabsorption. So the, the thing about thiazides is you you, you also get rid of sodium, not just the water. Um, thiazide diuretics also increase calcium reabsorption, which may be beneficial if you have kidney stones. So thiazide diuretics may be used there. And its chronic use uh, of thiazides also results in, uh, or is used for hypertension treatment um, through a sort of a, s a systemic vasodilatory effect. Uh, the, the underlying etiology is not entirely clear. The, diure the osmotic diuretics, mannitol and glycerol, um, freely filtered but not reabsorbed so that that pulls water as an osmotic agent into the, into the distal tubules so that you can then uh, excrete the free water. Switching gears just a little bit, dopamine. Dopamine, um, again, is controversial. It has a very significant um, natriuretic effect due to its dopamine 1 receptor activity in the kidneys. So there is a dopamine 1 receptor. It causes natriuresis for sure. It will make you uh, pee. Uh, it may also increase GFR if you have functional nephrons left. Um, and it may reduce proximal tubular, tubular sodium reabsorption. So in this way, dopamine is can act as a diuretic. But there is no effect, no clinical effect on acute kidney injury. So again, like using other diuretics, it improves the systemic complications, but it doesn't prevent you from needing renal replacement therapy if you're going to. So there's no effect on acute kidney injury, but it may prevent systemic complications. So the volume overload, the some of the electrolyte abnormalities may be prevented if you if you lose dopamine. Also realize that, that there's an increased risk of dysrhythmias and hypertension and other issues that occur from dopamine because of the, the systemic vasoconstriction, the ionotropy that occurs with it as well. Now these typically occur at higher doses, but there's a, there's a downside to the use of dopamine. 
for, as a diuretic. Phenoldipam is a pure do, uh, dopamine agonist. It's FDA approved to treat s severe hypertension. And it does. It will, uh, as compared to dopamine, uh, phenoldipam will bring your blood pressure down. Like dopamine, it will cause you to make urine. Uh, it has a pretty significant natural uretic effect for the same reason, the dopamine 1 receptors. It increases GFR and free water elimination and uh, reduces sodium reabsorption. It's very controversial as well, in large part because it's expensive, it can cause hypotension, and again, there's no data that suggests it actually improves renal outcomes. Turning to neuromuscular blocking drugs, there's sort of four commonly used neuromuscular blocking drugs in the succinylcholine, rocuronium, vecuronium, and cisatricurium. Um, the one that's sort of most important to talk about, or the two that are sort of most important to talk about in the setting of renal dysfunction, succinylcholine and vecuronium. We'll talk about it in a little more, but uh, remember vecuronium is the drug that accumulates uh, in renal failure. So the overall sort of summary of, of neuromuscular blocking effect in renal failure, for succinylcholine, its major termination route is, as you know, metabolism. There's no real change necessary for renal failure dosing and the duration is the same. With rocuronium, the dosing is the same and the duration is roughly the same. With vecuronium, the dosing is the same, but you may have an extended duration. So use with vecuronium with uh, caution. And then in cisatricurium, there should be no difference in dosing or duration. Succinylcholine is, 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 is an interesting problem because um, it's not really contraindicated in patients with chronic renal failure provided that your potassium is normal. So it's not that there's a real injury that occurs because of the chronic kidney disease, it's that patients with chronic di kidney disease typically have a higher potassium. So the rise in potassium that you get from normal patients is going to be the same that you're going to get for patients with chronic kidney disease or acute kidney injury both. You're still going to get the 0.5 to 1 milliequivalents per liter increase. It's just if you start with a potassium of 6, you're going to get into danger areas with your hyperkalemia at a greater rate than if you start with a potassium of four. That's the, big, that's the big issue. Now for me, I also find that patients who have chronic kidney disease are frequently not as mobile. They may, may be more likely to, be, to have other complications or other contraindications to, uh, to succinylcholine at the same time because they're chronically hospitalized, chronically institutionalized, they may be malnourished. So I typically don't use succinylcholine in patients with chronic kidney disease but that's my, only my anecdotal clinical experience. Similar to the neuromuscular blocking agents, neostigmine's overall volume of distribution is not changed, so the dosing doesn't change. The duration, duration of action may be increased because of the metabolism and urinary excretion that neostigmine undergoes. There's an increased duration of, uh, the, the increased duration of action, though typically balances the duration of action for the um, neuromuscular blocking agents. So the two sort of uh, cancel each other out and normal dosing can be used for both. There is a concern of recurarization, but there are no real reported cases, so it's a hypothetical at best. There are some opioids that are not recommended because they have active metabolites. These includes, include morphine and Demerol, meperidine. There are some that are really recommended because it's been shown to have no active, active metabolites, fentanyl and sufentanyl. And then there's sort of a mixed recommendation because of uh, some partial data and partial renal excretion, particularly for hydromorphone. So as it comes to opioids, I typically try not to use morphine or Demerol in patients with acute kidney injury or chronic kidney disease and switch to usually, typically fentanyl, sufentanyl if I need. Ketorolac, Toradol, definitely increases your risk of acute kidney injury. That's, as all in said, it increases your risk of acute kidney injury. It decreases renal perfusion similar to other uh, non-steroidal agents. It appears to be dose dependent and it re uh, decreases prostaglandin formation. Risk factors for acute kidney injury are like others, impaired renal function, heart failure, liver dysfunction, elderly patients, and patients taking other, in other agents that increase your, your risk of AKI. Elect electrolytes, remember sodium is, um, is fundamentally a free water problem. And the three most common uh, sodium disorders, SIADH, cerebral salt wasting, and diabetes insipidus are sort of sum summarized here. 
in terms of what you might expect in terms of urine volume, serum sodium, serum, serum osmolality, urine osmolality, and urine sodium. Hypernatremia is typically not a sodium, it's a sodium disorder, but it's not caused because you have too much total body sodium. It's because you have not enough free water, either most commonly from diuretic use or diabetes insipidus. And remember, frequently hypernatremia may coexist with hypovolemia. So the reversal of hypovolemia is typically one of the first steps to treating hypernatremia. And you always want to restore with um, balanced salt solution, so normal saline or LR, uh, before you institute a free water replacement strategy. Free water replacement strategies do very little to restore intravascular volume, whereas balanced salt solutions do that much better. So when you think about the diagnosis of hypernatremia, there's sort of two questions to ask, volume status and urinary sodium. And using those two things in a sort of a two by two table, you can figure out what the underlying cause is. So if you have low volume status, they're hypovolemic, and their urinary sodium is low, they typically have diabetes insipidus or some osmotic diuresis. If they have a low volume status and a normal urinary sodium, which is about uh, 20 to 30, uh, then this is typically from GI losses of free water or skin losses of free water. Maybe you've had a big burn and you're just losing free water right out of, you know, right across your skin. Uh, if you have high or normal volume status and low urine sodium, this is going to be a mineral or corticoid excess. And then high volume status or normal volume status and a normal urine sodium is typically from salt administration. Either we've given them 3% sodium, they've eaten a bunch of salt tablets, there's some hydrogenic salt administration. If, if uh, instead of the table, you prefer looking at it uh, in sort of a flow diagram fashion, this is the same sort of concept to get you from a diagnosis or to get you to a diagnosis. Now the treatment, number one, correct reversible causes. If what you're doing is giving sodium, obviously stop uh, giving sodium either through oral intake, IV fluids, or medications. And remember, many medications are mixed in sodium chloride. So asking your pharmacist, is this patient getting sodium in some way, uh, can dramatically help. Restore the intravascular volume deficit. Typically, as I said, using LR, normal saline, some isotonic IV fluid, and then replace the free water deficit. Can be calculated, the free water deficit can be calculated by the formula 0.6 times the body uh, body weight, which gets you to the total body water, times the difference between the actual sodium and 140 divided by 140. Um, typically, half the free water should be replaced in the first 24 hours, the remainder in the, the next 48 hours. Please remember that that only um, replaces the deficit. So if during that 36 hours that you're replacing the deficit, they have ongoing free water loss, you have to account for that as well. So uh, that's one area where we typically uh, fail patients. Remember the rapid restoration of, of normal sodium chlor concentrations in chronically hypernatremic patients results in uh, cerebral edema, herniation syndromes, and possibly death. So bringing someone's sodium from 160 to 140 can be dangerous. Hyponatremia is associated with either free water excess, which is much more common, or very rarely sodium deficits. The most common problem is, is SIADH. Cerebral salt wasting also can occur, particularly in the setting of uh, neuro, neurologic injury, particularly subarachnoid hemorrhage. And remember the rapid cor re correction of hyponatremia results in central pontine myelinolysis. Um, the, the diagnostic strategy for hyponatremia is a little more complicated than hypernatremia. So this is summarized in the, 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 the flow diagram here. The treatment of hyponatremia really depends on the underlying etiology. But the, the sort of the first step is free water restriction, particularly in SIADH. Salt replacement, uh, either through oral salt tablets, uh, normal saline, or even hyper, uh, hypertonic saline if necessary. Loop diuretics because of their uh, diuretic effect uh, and the, the resolution of free water. And then in certain cases, the vas V2 or vasopressin receptor antagonist therapy can be used. This is typically folks who have some underlying chronic reason for, uh, for hyponatremia. 
Citropontine myelinolysis, it typically occurs two to three to four days after you've aggressively corrected that. So it doesn't happen at the time of injury. It takes a little bit of time to occur, uh, typically from overly rapid correction of, of chronic hyponatremia, and it occurs from direct injury to, to white matter of the spinal cord. Hyperkalemia, um, the treatments basically are calcium, which is not a treatment in and of itself, right? It's a prevention of complications therapy. You don't make your, potassi your, 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 your potassium concentration any better by giving calcium. And there's very little indication for prophylactic calcium use. So I typically do not give calcium in the setting of hyperkalemia unless there are EKG abnormalities. Um, insulin glucose. Remember, it's the insulin portion of insulin glucose that actually drives down the, the potassium. The glucose is there just to make sure you don't get a complication from a, a bolus of insulin. Albuterol or any beta-2 agonist. So if you're giving boluses of epi, that too will improve um, uh, uh, potassium concentrations. Loop diuretics, k exhalate, and then hemodialysis. In patients who are in uh, an extremis or having some complication, you may need to uh, even need ECMO for a period of time while you're getting hemodialysis to carry them through. Hypercalcemia uh, typically causes both two problems, cardiovascular problems and neuromuscular problems. In terms of the cardiac problems, typically causes hypertension, may cause cardiac ischemia, arrhythmias, conduction abnormalities, and even sudden death, VFib. In terms of the neuromuscular system, it can cause decreased mentation, so altered mental status, may cause seizures, may even cause coma. The causes of hypercalcemia -cal first is hyperparathyroidism, thyrotoxicosis, excessive intake of either vitamins A or vitamin D, granulomatous disease, malignancies, and most commonly immobilization. Treatment of, for hypercalcemia is to control the underlying disease. It seems to be the answer for everything, right? Rehydration to restore intravascular volume. Most of these patients will be hypo, hypovolemic. Uh, typically, we use normal saline because there's no calcium in normal saline. You, may, you can use forced diuresis with a loop diuretic and then just continuously replace your output so that they don't become further hypovolemic and, if necessary, dialysis. Sort of the last slide is refeeding syndrome. Remember, refeeding syndrome occurs in someone who has uh, uh, been has chronic severe malnutrition, typically for more than five days, maybe even longer than that. They don't have to be completely free of f food; they just have to be relatively malnourished. So, um, an alcoholic, for example, who's been on a bender for the last three or four or five days and has had no good oral nutrition, can have refeeding syndrome. It's not that they just haven't eaten or had any oral intake, it's that they've not had good nutrition. Um, and it's basically a very rapid fluid and electrolyte abnormalities that can be severe causing death. Um, it's related to an exaggerated insulin response of stimulating intense lipogenesis and gluconeogenesis. Um, typically causes everything, all the electrolytes to be low. So hypomagnesemia, hypophosphatemia, hypokalemia, and hypoglycemia. Any questions? Thank you very much. My email address is here. Please feel free to email me with any questions or concerns. Thank you so much. Have a good day.